TV One. TV for life. Good evening and welcome to Prime Time News here on TV1. You're joining me, David Paldano. Now, before we head into your stories in more detail, let's first take a look at the headlines. This Supreme Mahanayak of Sri Lanka Amrapura Mahanikaya, the most venerable Dodampahala Chandrasiri Mahanayak Thera, passes away. Dengue cases could spike during monsoon season. Over 400 dengue cases reported on Monday. Will Vadivil Suresh join the government? <laughs> Catholic Church condemns statements by Jerome Fernando. Activists file complaint with CID. Suspect remanded for links to the Gotabe Rajapaksha assassination attempt in 2006, released after 15 years. SJB files legal action for compensation following Express Pearl disaster. Sri Lanka's police commission gets a new chairman. The Supreme Mahanayaka of Sri Lanka Amrapuram Mahanikaya, Agya Mahapandita, the most venerable Dodam Pahala Chandrasiri Mahanayaka Thera, passed away this afternoon. The Supreme Mahanayaka of Sri Lanka Amarapura Mahanikaya was hospitalized for an illness and passed away at the age of 84 while receiving treatment at a private hospital in Colombo. Born on the 20th of December 1939 as Edirivira Patabandige Sugunadasa in Dodampahala Mathara, he decided to enter the order to become a monk on the 25th of November 1950. After obtaining his primary education from the Dodampahala Central College, the late Mahanayaka Thero obtained his religious education from the Virabha Pirivana in Mathara and later obtained his higher education from the Vidyaloka Pirivana in Gaul. He was ordained on the 17th of June 1962. The most venerable Dodam Pahala Chandra Siri Mahanayaka Thero was appointed as the Supreme Mahanayaka of the Amarapura Mahanikaya on the 20th of July 2021 and rendered a great service to the Buddha Sasana. He was a pioneer in setting up the Sangha quarters of the Amarapura Mahanikaya, setting up the Tapovana meditation centers and launching the Buddhist education institution named the Sri Vangisa Pirivena. The remains of the late most venerable Dodampahala Chandrasiri Mahanayaka Thero will be moved to the Rajagiriya Gautama Thapo Vanaya. Sri Lanka's Dengue Control Unit warns that dengue cases could spike during the upcoming monsoon season. The National Dengue Control Unit said that 412 dengue cases were reported in the country yesterday. The National Dengue Control Unit pointed out a significant spike in the number of dengue cases reported across the country. In 2023, so far 22 people have died as a result of dengue fever. During the same period, over 34,000 dengue cases were reported across the country. The statistics from the National Dengue Control Unit reveal that during the 19th week of 2022, only 1,294 dengue cases were reported. However, during the 19th week of 2023, that figure spikes to an alarming 2,029 dengue cases. We observed a 50% to 60% spike in the spread of dengue and the main reason for this can be attributed to the change in the rainfall pattern. There are two types of mosquitoes, namely Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus that transmit dengue. The highest population density is formed by the Aedes aegypti mosquito. However, last time around, it was the Aedes albopictus and they have been replaced this time. 
These two can be attributed to the spike in dengue fever. There are four serotypes of dengue viruses, designated as denv one denv two denv three and denv four and we mostly witnessed denv two in the past, and most of the human population have antibodies to fight against it. That somewhat controlled the spread. However, when we test the blood samples of the latest cases, we notice the presence of denv three Antibodies in the human body against it are low, and that attributes to the rapid spread of the virus. प्रतिशक्ति करने आवामा ये आवामा मात्र मनीषा वायरस ये जानता है वातर पैतृरी में वेगवत वे है कि 261 out of the 412 dengue cases reported on Monday were from the Western Province and 132 of them were from the Colombo district while 98 were from the Gampaha district. We have increased the number of home inspections to locate dengue breeding grounds. We have declared two weeks for this and instituted legal action against 77 people during this period. We did not receive the technical grade malathion for fumigation for almost eight months. However, we were able to source them and the fumigation process is taking place in a streamlined manner. Is Sri Lanka facing a shortage of the chemical used to combat the spread of dengue? Sri Lanka's health ministry said that the chemicals required for the fumigation process are in adequate supply. Director General of Health Services Dr. Asela Gunavardhana speaking to News First said that the country is in possession of adequate stocks to last for more than a year. He stressed that the chemicals will be used only when essential during the dengue control programs. However, tests have revealed that the efficacy of the chemicals used in the fumigation process had dropped considerably. It is reported that research and tests are continuing over the matter. If anyone is down with a fever, they must seek immediate medical attention. At the same time, dengue breeding grounds must be destroyed. Then it is possible to control the spread of dengue. In 2017, a dengue epidemic of unexpected magnitude occurred in Sri Lanka. More than 180,000 cases were recorded that year, with a large amount of deaths as well. The country's healthcare system is facing a serious medicine shortage. 120 essential medicines are in short supply in the health system and the same goes with other medicines as well. It is with the greatest difficulty that blood tests, surgeries and other medical programs are taking place. At the same time, there is a human resource issue with doctors, nurses and staff leaving the healthcare system. If a severe dengue epidemic like what happened in 2017 reoccurs, we must raise concern whether our healthcare system can actually cope with it. The collective of medical faculty student activists protested in Colombo against attempts to launch private medical colleges. They began a protest march from opposite the Vihar Mahadevi Park in Colombo. The protest march reached Horton Place when the police intervened. A heated situation arose and the police used water cannons on the protesters. Shortly after, the group of protesters dispersed. We reminded the government that they should not attempt to meddle with the education and health facilities of the citizens of this country. We warned the government not to destroy the free health service in this country. Anaturu and the Vima, Apiandu, the Ladunna. 
In recent days, the Sri Lankan political landscape was marred with possible defections to the government. At the same time, certain factions urged that the SJB as a political party must extend its support to the government. Minister Harin Fernando, the president of the Lanka Jatika Estate Workers Union and the Union Secretary SJB MP Vadibil Suresh attended several events together in recent weeks. The duo also attended an event on Monday evening and journalists posed questions on the possibility of supporting the government. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That is not an issue. The issue I have is the problems my community faces. They go through many hardships along with the Samudri issue. I have spoken to the president about this. Those arrangements are being carried out. We are still part of the SJB. Minister Harin, Mano Ganeshan and I are all in the Samagi Janabala Vegya. There are many who are part of the SJB. We cannot be thinking about parties and colours at this crucial point. I think Sajid Premadasa, Rani Vikrama Singha and everyone else should work together. I think the entirety of the SJB should unite. That will help us save the country. MP Vadivel Suresh expressed his views at a press briefing as well. I stood up in the middle of a meeting and told Sajid Premadasa that we should all unite. I asked him why he was isolating the party even when the president has invited the SJB to strengthen the country. After strengthening the country, we can talk about other things. We know that some people in the opposition are getting their requirements fulfilled. However, parliamentarian of the Samagijana Balavegya, Kins Nelson, had the following to say. The opposition has been invited to help save the country many times. We always say that we are ready to help. However, instead of trying to develop the country, what the government is trying to do is bribe MPs of the opposition to join them. I must emphasize that there is not a single MP who will take the government's bait. If we support the government, we will only support the correct decision taken by the government, and that too as a party. This is what the JVP had to say. Sajit has no shame. We saw yesterday that after Rana Vikrama Singha appointed some young people to selection committees, Sajit said that that was an extremely noble action. We would like to emphasize that when Sajit supports what Ranil does, it is to no surprise that his party members support Ranil as well. The Working Committee of the Samagi Janabala Vegya has unanimously decided to name opposition leader Sajid Premadasa as the next presidential candidate from the Samagi Jana Alliance headed by the Samagi Janabala Vegya. Accordingly, a proposal submitted by SJB General Secretary Ranjit Madhum Bandara and former MP Sujiva Sena Singha in this regard was unanimously approved by the SJB Working Committee during its meeting held on Tuesday. Opposition leader Sajid Premadasa speaking at the meeting informed the Working Committee that he would take up both the internal and external responsibilities in building an SJB-led alliance. The president has decided to relieve three governors from their positions. However, their replacements have not yet been announced. The president's media division announced that the appointment of the new governors for the northern, eastern and northwestern provinces will be done by Wednesday. Former governor of the eastern province, Anuradha Yahampat, attended a press briefing at the eastern province governor's office. As much as we were able to carry out many of our duties with no political influence, at certain points there were attempts to influence us for various reasons. My appointment was a political one. However, I do not have a political background. Before I leave the East, what I have to say is that we should all commit ourselves to create a law-abiding and disciplined society. MP Udayana Kirindakoda, who represents the Freedom People's Congress, expressed the following with regard to the governor's issue. 
අපි මේක දුරදි දැක්කා ඒ හින්දා තමයි අපි ඒ වෙලාවෙත් කිව්වේ ශ්‍රී ලංකා පොදු ජන පෙරමුණේ We saw this coming this is why we said that everything will be better if we appointed a leader who has a mandate those who laughed at us back then are now suffering because they lost their titles this is a situation that should be expected we feel disappointed that our leaders couldn't see this coming in this political atmosphere we now have to agree with everything we rejected back then this is a very disappointing situation api pratikshep karpu dewal nawada hondai kiyamin yanna vela thiye nithi meka harima kanagaru dayaka thayata Samagi Youth Balavegya Vice Chairman Rehan Jayavikrama was summoned to the CID today morning to provide a statement over the incident where Rani Vikrama Singha's house was set on fire on the 9th of July last year and for damages caused during the incident. A statement was obtained from me before as well. Though I do not respect the politicians who give out orders, I respect the justice system. I had already told them what I needed to say. I was not involved in it and I did not aid in it. I was not even in the area in question. I hope to respond in the same manner again. As a member of the SJB, I want to make it clear that I would not be intimidated in any manner. <laughs> Sri Lankan authorities have imposed an overseas travel ban on Jerome Fernando. Police spokesperson SSP Nihal Thaldewa said that the travel ban was imposed based on an order the Criminal Investigations Department obtained from court. The CID CID has launched an investigation regarding a statement made by Jerome Fernando. The Catholic Church says that it strongly condemns the statements made by Jerome Fernando, saying that it disrupts religious harmony. මේ ජෙරම් ප්‍රනාන්දු නැමැත්තා කතෝලික පූජා ප්‍රසාද තුමෙකු හෝ කතෝලික සභාවට කිසිදු ලෙසකින් සම්බන්ධ He would like to stress that Jerome Fernando is not a Catholic priest and is not linked to the Catholic Church in any manner. It is observed by us that the recent comments made by him during one of his sermons likely poses a threat to religious coexistence in the country and may incite communal violence. Social media has revealed the various overseas links of Jerome Fernando as well as his conduct. It is alarming to note that the authorities have failed to take any action regarding this we condemn the statements made by Jerome Fernando that hurt the religious sentiments of our brothers and sisters from the Buddhist Hindu and Islamic faiths and also put in danger the religious coexistence in the country we reject those statements made by him he had constructed massive luxurious halls and we need to look into the fact as to how did he obtain permission for these constructions were these done by following the proper legal procedures <laughs> We witnessed similar incidents in the recent past. Some consider that inciting religious hatred and bringing a threat to the nation is the way to gain political power. We must think and speculate if this is doing the same thing. A group of religious leaders led by Venerable Elle Gunawan Sathera addressed a press conference today. Tem ratawal vividh anshavaling apay rata etulote ringala apay janatava terti na samagya samadaane bidadala. Various countries are slowly creeping into our country through different means. They are trying to destroy the peace and harmony of this country's people. Do not make all of us take to the streets. I would like to strongly tell this to the people who are trying to create conflicts and divide the citizens. Such people live off dollars. We cannot let them earn their dollars to simply create conflict in this country. Tomorrow, we will take the matter to the Supreme Court. Do not mistake our kindness for cowardice. The Sarva Park Shikaragala Karuo movement filed a complaint with the Criminal Investigations Department. We clearly remember the most humiliating political conspiracy in this country that was hatched in 2019 to make Gotabaya Rajpaksa the president. We have serious doubts that this is the next conspiracy of the Rajpaksa gang. We have a serious suspicion that he is trying to make the next Rajpaksa the president. The Rajpaksa family is in this photo and on this side is a person who claims to be a prophet named Jerome Fernando. Recently Al Jazeera exposed a person identified as a gold smuggler in Zimbabwe who launders money. 
that person is this prophet Hubert Angel. He too is in this photograph. It is clear that the Rajpaksas linked themselves to Hubert Angel and Prophet Jerome to launder their money. We have serious concerns whether they are trying to hatch the next political conspiracy in this country. This was the clarification made by the cabinet spokesperson in this regard. Katulika Deva Gati Vare Sin Buddha Dharma Saha Anikut Agam Vata Pahasamana Akare Deshana Patmin City Bava Api Dutwa Vivida Samaja Madhya Tulin. It may be Bandha Yamkisi Katikavata at the Una the Cabinet Mandele Tuladi. Cabinet Mande Tuladi Atikaru Janadi Petuma. In the cabinet, the president emphasized that compared to the situation a year ago, he has transformed this country into a peaceful, non-violent country where basic human rights are protected. Every citizen has the right to live in a place of their choice. The president has officially informed the security forces and all other parties to take all possible measures to prevent any activity that threatens such freedoms. The government has a responsibility and will take the necessary measures to protect the basic human rights and ensure national security. This is what the president told the cabinet. News first with the people. Supermarket taking a gate or la beer like a penny insurance car gunner, meeting insurance supermarket ticket. Insurance car gunner, insure me the Katakran, Sri Lanka, the insurance supermarket ticket. Insure me dot LK. Welcome back to the news. A notice has been made stating that the lawsuit filed by Sri Lanka at the Singapore High Court over the Express Pearl Maritime Disaster is to be referred to the Singapore International Commercial Court. Sri Lanka had filed a case seeking compensation for the damages caused to its marine environment following the shipping disaster in 2021. The country's Attorney General's Department said that government decisions with respect to the notice will be informed to the Singapore High Court following consultations with all parties. Sri Lanka's Attorney General's Department said that when the case was called up at the Singapore High Court on Monday, the notice was made to refer the court to the Singaporean International Commercial Court. The case will be called up again for consideration on the 1st of June 2023 and Sri Lanka is expected to announce whether the matter will be moved to the Singapore International Commercial Court or not on that day. The Samagijana Balavege filed a case at the Commercial High Court of Colombo to recover the compensation from the Express Pearl Maritime Disaster. Earlier, the General Secretary of the Samagijana Balavege, together with several fishermen's associations in the community, sent letters of demands to the ship owner to pay $6.4 billion as compensation for the damage it caused to the Sea of Sri Lanka. And if it is not paid in a particular period, legal action will be filed against them. Since the ship owner company failed to respond to the letter in the given time frame, President's Council Upul Jai Surya took steps to file litigation against the ship owner in the Commercial High Court of Colombo. This case was filed as a public interest litigation. We filed action regarding the compensation in court today. Last week, we sent a letter of demand to the respondents of this case, the ship company, its insurance company, representatives of these companies and the company that holds the custody of the ship were named as respondents for this case. We also decided that it is better to hear this case in Sri Lanka. President's Council Upul Jai Surya and his legal team are taking the necessary action in this regard. It has been over a year since the Express Pearl Maritime Disaster took place. The government of Sri Lanka has filed a lawsuit in Singapore to claim compensation for the damages caused to its marine environment. The compensation claim is $6.4 billion. Samagijana Balavega has now filed a case in the High Court and applied for this same compensation within the judicial system of our country. $6.4 billion is a relief for the country that is trying to overcome its worst economic crisis. $6.4 billion is a relief for the country that is trying to overcome its worst ever economic crisis. Sri Lanka received $3 billion from the International Monetary Fund for four years on strict terms. If we are able to secure $6.4 billion for the damage done to our marine environment without any conditions, won't it give comfort to the economy? Is it not possible to use this amount to buy essential medicines, to reduce the price of fuel and provide relief to the people of the country? But is the government making a considerable effort to 
recover this compensation. Suing in Singapore without filing a lawsuit in our country, not adequately intervening in the case assigned to the shipping company to limit compensation, and with the allegation of taking a bribe of $250 million, the issue is still without a definite decision. The President has made two new appointments with the approval of the Constitutional Council. President Ranil Vikramasinghe has appointed Ms. K. A. Rohanadira, the current Parliament Chief of Staff and Deputy Secretary General of Parliament, to the position of Parliamentary Secretary General with the effect from 23rd of May 2023 with the approval of the Constitutional Council. She would fill the position that would be left vacant following the retirement of Dhammika Dasanayaka. President Ranil Vikramasinghe also appointed members to the National Police Commission. Retired High Court Judge Lalitha Kanayaka was appointed as Chairman of the NPC. Sivalingam Arun, who was arrested on a charge of aiding an attempt on the life of Gautabe Rajpaksa when he was the Defence Secretary, was acquitted and released from all charges. Sivalingam Arun spent 15 years in jail and penned several books, and two of them even received accolades at the State Literary Awards Ceremony 2022. Civil Ingham Arunan was arrested under the Prevention of Terrorism Act in 2009 on a charge of aiding an attempt on the life of Gota Bay Rajapaksha in 2006 when he was the Defence Secretary. He was detained at the New Magazine prison since then. When the case was taken up in the presence of Colombo High Court Judge Navaratna Marasingha, on Monday, the additional Solicitor General appearing for the Attorney General informed the court that the case against the suspect will not be carried forward. Court ruled that the confession made by the suspect to an Assistant Superintendent of Police under the PTA was not voluntary and thus ordered to acquit and release the suspect. 43-year-old Civil Lingam Arunan is an engineering graduate from the Murutu University. He was arrested while reading for his postgraduate degree at the University of Peradeniya. During his time in Riman Prison, Sivalingam Arunan penned seven books in Tamil and one in English. At the State Literary Award Ceremony 2022, the award for the Best Independent Tamil Novel was presented to Sivalingam Arunan for the Adurasale novel. In 2016, he won the award for the Best Independent Tamil Novel as well. The rupee has further strengthened against the US dollar. According to the exchange rates announced by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, the selling price of one US dollar was 318 rupees and 79 cents. The buying price of one US dollar today was 305 rupees and 43 cents. Sri Lanka's Port Authority Shipping and Aviation Minister Nimal Siripala de Silva said that the Hambantota port with China cannot be used for war. De Silva spoke to India's Vion on the sidelines of the 6th International Indian Ocean Conference in Bangladeshi capital Dhaka and said that Sri Lanka has to be mindful about the security of India. We have excellent relationships with India and India is helping us a lot and we are reciprocating. Now recently we started flights from India to our latest airport in Jaffna, Palali Airport and we are trying to launch a ferry service between Madras and KK's newly constructed port and so the connectivity is there and in time to come there will be more tourists visiting Sri Lanka for religious purpose as well as for the tourism also. Really we have to be mindful about the security of India. India. India is an emerging nation in the Asian continent. We have a very friendly relationship and India is helping us very much. Therefore, when we talk about Trincomalee, we have to ensure the safety and security of India also. Anything which threatens the safety and security of India, we should not permit. Hamban Tota, we want to sell that port. We want to give that. So then we ask the US to take it over. Mm. We ask India to take it over. Mm. But nobody take it over and the Chinese took it over. So what can we do? Mm. So, but as far as the security of the country and the Indian Ocean is concerned, our agreement is very strong. Navigation and other things are done by mm. us and it cannot be used as a port for any war or for any defense purposes. It's a commercial port. The government of Japan through the flood to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations is providing 4.6 million US dollars to strengthen the production capacity of smallholder paddy farmers in identified districts of the dry and intermediate zones of Sri Lanka. 
Smallholder farmers are amongst the most vulnerable rural communities, predominantly cultivating rice for self-consumption. The government of Japan, through the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, is providing 4.6 million U.S. dollars to strengthen the production capacity. Through the initiative, approximately 250,000 smallholder paddy farmers cultivating paddy on land holdings up to one hectare in identified districts of the dry and intermediate zones will receive up to 50 kilograms of urea fertilizer each for the upcoming Maha cropping season. The fertilizer will be provided free of cost and distribution will be carried out with the support of the Ministry of Agriculture and the Department of Agrarian Development. The project will also provide smallholder paddy farmers with sensitization material on the efficient use of fertilizer to maximize production. The workshop on Carbon Net Zero 2050 Roadmap and Strategic Plan was held today in Colombo. The validation workshop on Carbon Net Zero 2050 Roadmap and Strategic Plan organized by the Ministry of Environment in collaboration with the United Nations Development Program of Sri Lanka took place in Colombo today. Sri Lanka has made significant strides in expanding its renewable energy capacity. The government has implemented policies and in incentives to promote the development of solar, wind and hydroelectric power projects. We have been actively encouraging the use of solar energy. The Surya Palasangrama program aims to install rooftop solar panels on houses and promote the use of solar power in industries and commercial buildings. This initiative has not only reduced carbon emissions but has also empowered communities communities to generate their own clean energy. Under the purview of excellency, we are planning to implement interna the International University of Climate Change, which will be a key milestone in the global climate change agenda. The workshop entailed in-depth discussion into the Carbon Net Zero 2050 Roadmap and strategic plan for the energy, transport, agriculture, waste, industry and forestry sector as well. As we all know, we have uh, certain pledges. One is nationally determined contributions and then we have pledged that Sri Lanka would be net zero by 2050 and then we have pledged 32 percent of forest cover by 2030. Also we have targeted 70 percent of electricity generation to be from renewable resources. For this task one thing we need to have a good roadmap. From now onwards as a country like in any area in development in sustainable development in net zero any area we need to embrace the global situation global change and we had to get the support from friendly countries organizations un system and other systems we are soliciting uh, since recently we are soliciting support from gggi and undp on carbon but we would like to i think uh, bring the attention of the government that we can't get away with uh, the, the carbon tax. I think number one is climate literacy, so therefore people must know uh, what we are doing. The UN resident representative stressed on climate literacy. As a small but important part of our work, they launched last week of the pilot phase of converting tuk-tuks to electric tuk-tuks. I really want to appreciate and thank the Minister of Environment for driving the 2050 Carbon Net Zero Roadmap Development Process. And the Climate Change Secretariat, I really wanted to emphasize this uh, the underlying importance of, of climate literacy for the government to keep setting the necessary policy and a conducive policy environment to support incentives for the whole society. The validation workshop on Carbon Net Zero 2050 Roadmap and Strategic Plan was supported by the UNDP. Sri Lanka and Myanmar have launched talks to establish direct air connectivity between the two countries. Ambassador of Sri Lanka to Myanmar, Janaka Bandara, held a meeting with the top management of Myanmar Airways International with the view of establishing direct air connectivity between Sri Lanka and Myanmar. Chairman Ang Ang Zaw and Chief Commercial Officer Thanes Kumar represented Myanmar Airways International in the discussion. The ambassador highlighted the significance of direct air connectivity in promoting the tourism industries of both destinations. It was underlined that travelers between the two countries were wasting considerable time at transits while the flight time is just less than three hours. The ambassador assured that there would be a sizable traffic up and down between these two significant destinations underpinned by historic, cultural and religious affinities. The Special Task Force has apprehended two individuals for possessing banned herbicides. 
Acting on a tip they had received, a team of officers from the police special task force conducted raids in Boga Hakumbara and Valley Mada. The suspects, aged 31 and 53, were arrested and handed over for further investigation. The seized items included various banned pesticides and the authorities are conducting a thorough investigation into the origin and intended use of the confiscated material. I want to hear about the update. More than 10,055 people belonging to 2,511 families in nine districts have been affected by the bad weather that was experienced during the past few days. The Disaster Management Center says that one person was reported missing and seven others were injured due to various disasters. Flood water levels in some areas have started to recede. Operations are still underway to locate an individual who had gone missing after he was washed away by flood waters last evening in Pavanvella, Akurasa. The victim was a 42-year-old resident of Lower Aturalia. The individual had been swept away while attempting to remove debris that was flowing with the flood waters. His first correspondence said that water levels in some lowland areas that were flooded with heavy rains still remain inundated. This was a situation opposite the Kotapitiya Kanindu Vidyalaya this morning. Many lowlands around the Aturalia Divisional Secretariat were inundated. Several areas in Nagoda and Badegama were inundated due to the rising water levels of the Ging River. Flood waters in Kaddua Matara are gradually receding. One bank close to the bridge that was built across the Dellavala along the Hapitia Tiembarahena Road in Nelua was washed away by heavy rainfall. People living in Vadimulla, Kadihingala and Baranivala were severely inconvenienced by this. Several areas in Vatikadara and Atudua and some places along the Kadua Matara main road were inundated due to the rising water levels of the Nilvala River. The Med Department said that showers or thunder showers will occur at several places in western Sabaragamu, northwestern, central and eastern provinces and in the Mulatev district. And with that we wrap up primetime news here on TV1. For more news, log on to our award winning website that is www.newsfirst.lk. For the News First team, I'm Debbie Paldano. Take care and good night.